Good morning. And it is a good morning. Just listen. It's moved just a little bit further away, about 30 metres behind us is a song thrush and that bird has been singing for pretty much all the daylight hours for the last three days. It sings in the morning, it sings at lunchtime, it was singing yesterday afternoon and just before it got dark last night I came out and it was still pumping that song out. Singing its little heart out. It really is. I mean, it must have a sore throat by now, surely. All day long, that male song thrush is performing. And to be able to hear it, just, you know, in, I can hear it when I'm in the house, I can hear it when I'm in the bedroom. I was listening to it whilst I was having a shave this morning. It's totally uplifting. It's put me in a much better mood than I was in yesterday morning. But then I also got out of bed on the right side today because I read something fantastic on Twitter the last night. And that was that someone in Walthamstow have been on their daily exercise walk, have been chalking the names of all of the different species of trees that were on the streets there. So that when other people were walking, they got them so, keeping your social space and taking your one daily exercise a day, then stop and look at those books. This is uh, Birds in a Cage. And it's uh, a book written by Derek Neiman and, or Nyman. And it's an extraordinary story and there are some parallels to what we're experiencing with self-isolation now. Now, I'm not drawing any direct comparisons between being a prisoner of war in the Second World War, in the Stalag camps at all, but these men were locked on the inside here. Soon after his arrival at Warview Camp in 1941, British Peter they decided to establish a bird-watching society. Now, there are parallels between the self-isolating bird club and that, the conditions are very different, but the great thing is that both Conda and Buxton and George then led to a, a life of fulfilment. So maybe there are people isolating Bird Club, but when we get over this terrible crisis, we'll stick with it, and that will allow them to do the yeah, birds in a cage, Derek, Nyman or Neiman. Well, on to our bird song of the day from UK. We've been asking you to go on Twitter to follow it. Um, today's Bird is this one. Have a listen to this. Oh, yeah. Bit of a long pause there. But you often you said to me once that the pause is often as important as the song. And I always yeah. remember that yeah. because it adds to that kind of anticipation, doesn't it? It makes that song even greater when there's just silence. It is, yeah, because you're just waiting for it to happen. It's a bit like the song thrush, or particularly the missile thrush, which has quite long pauses in, in between its cascades, and most, and most notably the nightingale, which has got very significant pauses. And it sort of just keeps you waiting. It's a bit like when they're answering questions on quiz shows and they, you know, they spit. Of it and then it comes and it's so much more powerful for the pause. Well, this wasn't a nightingale. Um, this was a Eurasian nuthatch. Now you'll find them breeding all over England and Wales, and they've just started breeding in the southern parts of Scotland as well. But they're very distinctive birds with that beautiful kind of black eyeliner going across. They almost look woodpecker-like, but they are songbird size. They are really nice, and you'll find them breeding often in old woodpecker nests as well. So so that's one from Sound Approach UK today, Eurasian Nut Hatch. At Sound Approach UK, follow them on Twitter, listen to the Eurasian Nut Hatch. And then if you are taking a walk in any woodland today, listen out for the real thing, because I've heard them calling over the last few days. Now, mm. are we doing... Uh, oh, no, go on. We've got to introduce Skull, Skull of the Day. Skull of the Day, go on. No, we put a photo up mm. earlier. There's lots of comments coming in already. Oh, it's a beautiful this one. is a skull. Have a look at this. Look at the shape of that bill. But perhaps most importantly... Mm. Look at the ridge over the top of the skull here. Very, very unique to this type of bird. Very unique. Look at the size of the eye there. There are the nasal bits here. Have a look at that. A good look. It's that groove, isn't it's it? It's the groove which will give it away. It's very, very important and very distinctive. Um, and it helps the bird do all kinds of interesting behaviours. 
Yeah. It's certain girls, yeah. It's, it's yeah. Certain, I don't want to give too many no. clues away because I feel like this one's going to be... It's one of my favourite skulls, though. Right, now, favourite skull to favourite bird in the world. We've been doing, on and off, a sparrow hawk of the day photograph from images that I've been looking at on Instagram, hashtag Sparrowhawk. Follow yeah. that, generally last thing in the evening, to flick through to see what people have posted that day. We've seen some crackers. We're going to do two more. Today's, I mean, honestly, this one takes my breath away. Look at that. Oh, come on. Come on. A male Sparrowhawk cleaning its tail, turned into a fan, that little split, in the in the in the feather at the end there as it's teasing it through its beak beautiful in sunlight the glowing golden eye what an extraordinary photograph this has been my screensaver for about the last three years on my computer i've never tired of it it was given to me by the one and only alan mcfadden and you can follow alan mcfadden on twitter alan mcfadden is M C F A D. Uh, uh, y e n McFadden 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 um, and also wildlifephotographyexperiences.com. This is Mad Max. Mad Max was a sparrowhawk that Alan was photographing for a long time. Once uh, Martin Hughes Games and I had the privilege of going and seeing Mad Max in the flesh. It was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. But. Um, We've got another one of Alan's pictures coming up tomorrow, which comes to that. He's the it's master amazing. when it comes to sparrowhawk photographs. The master. And tomorrow's is, well, honestly, I, 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 I'm already oh, so good. <laughs> it is just a you wait. beautiful, beautiful image. Now, of course, we've had so many of your amazing comments and questions coming in to us via our various social media platforms, whether that be Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. And the wonderful Lindsay Chapman has been scrolling through it day on day to pick out the best ones. So we've got her here today. We're going to be coming to her twice today to make sure we can get to as many of you as possible. So hi, Lindsay. How are you? Morning. Hello. Morning. There. Hello there. Yes, I have to say going through all the social media is now beginning to take quite a lot of my day uh, because there's so many comments and photographs and questions coming in. So thank you for all of those. On, on your song thrush this morning, many people saying they can hear loud and clear, and it's wonderful to hear that this morning. I've got a blackbird somewhere behind me here. I think it's it's just gone quiet since I've started um, talking, but it has literally been shouting at me this morning. So do have a listen out for that. And the sound of the nuthatch as well. I always think of a nuthatch uh, as being a bandit because of that black eye stripe. So uh, it's just something to keep in mind. Stunning picture of a sparrowhawk as well. Loads of you are saying morning to each other now on the chat, which is just wonderful. I'm going to add my voice to that. So hello to Coventry and Merseyside, to Sean in Manchester, Cornwall, Sussex, South Wales, Limerick and Normandy. They're just some of the ones that I've picked out this morning. So it's lovely, lovely to have you along. Now, Chris and Megs, I don't know whether you've had a few late nights, but I know that I have recently for various reasons. And one of them has been the supermoon. Chris, have you seen the supermoon? You had a look? Uh Yes, yes. For mooning it, definitely. Last night when I went out to put the food out for the animals here, the, the scraps from Megan's uh, cooking, that was quite a lot last night. It's quite scrappy cooking. Um, the, oh, she's, she's not here, that's why I was being rude about it. Um, so, yes, yes, the super moon was la you know, high and bright by then. But it's at its best, I think, Linz, when it first comes up, isn't it? And it's got that beautiful sort of honey glow to it. It's just gorgeous. And two nights ago, it was cloudy here in Manchester, but I could still feel still feel the light coming through the cloud. It was absolutely stunning. I've got a little book here. One of my aims this year was to do more stargazing. So you can get really simple guides um, out there to help you with that. And Linda Campbell on Facebook got in touch because she's got a, a camera out in the garden at night. No doubt the super moon is helping to see some brilliant stuff. And she captured this footage of a fox and a badger together. It's a bit of a face-off, and I wanted to ask you both, fox versus badger, which is more dominant? It's the badger, Lynn's yeah. hierarchy in, in the garden. So foxes are generally at the bottom. When you think about it, they've got sharp teeth, but no paws to speak of, and they're generally weighing in at about between five and eight kilograms. 
And then after that, you know, the badger will push the fox mm. off the food, a more formidable animal, up to say 13 kilograms or more. But it's got those front claws for digging and also a very robust set of teeth and strong jaws. But top of the garden list is the cat, because the cat is so much better armed than both of them. And cats will push foxes away and badgers away because of their lightning fast reactions and of course their full set of retractable but very sharp claws. There you go, that's the garden pecking order as it were. Um, have a little look well have a little listen to this in just a second so sylvia meller got in touch uh, she was out at night along a stream in east devon and she she heard some animals making a high-pitched noise and she's wondering whether it's otter cubs in the reeds it's a sort of high-pitched bark if you can have a bit of a listen to this Now, she doesn't think that's mice or, sh or shrews. She's wondering if it's some kind of mammal. Do you have any ideas? Well, it's, it's a head scratcher, this one. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, because it's at night. Um, mm. But there's a duet going on. I don't know if you noticed there, but the, there's a harsh call, which sounds a bit like a pheasant okay. type call, but it's, I don't think it is a pheasant, obviously. It's at night, they don't generally call at night. Um, but then that, that squeaky call, is definitely related to it because when the squeak happens the, 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 the bark happens so there are two animals that are communicating there that are producing different vocalizations so it could well be that one of them is a young animal and it's the contact call and the adult is responding to it with that bark that would be my guess i've got to say um i have heard young otters producing their contact calls but only those rescued animals in in, in wildlife hospitals I've, i'm not ever been that close to waters when you know when they've been cubs and been able to watch them so i can't i can't actually um, come up with an answer for that and say authoritatively whether it isn't it's something that we need to research and get mm. back to her but i think that the, the thing that we we mustn't miss there is that there's definitely communication between two two animals going on there's communication going on between two animals here actually it's, um, <laughs> nancy's morning kiss <laughs> that is that's that's fascinating. Thank you very much. And to Sylvia, who sent that in, I think it was on Facebook. It's really very interesting to have a look at what you're seeing across the country. So nice one there. Finally, piece of footage that I want to show you. This is from Heather Savage. Now, she is a teacher. She's working from home at the moment in Edinburgh. She absolutely loves the programmes. It's a bit of a break from her school day. And her class has been writing a project over the last couple of weeks. They've had to make a pop-up book about the polar animal of their choice and she's had one particular student who's called Carson who wants to be a marine biologist and Carson has clearly worked really really hard on his pop-up book he's actually really struggling to be at home sort of cooped up inside a little bit at the moment with the lockdown going on and she just wanted um, us all to have a look at this really because it is a fantastic piece of work well done to you Carson and also to Heather and all the other teachers that are either key working and going into school or teaching from home thank you so much for the work that you're doing it's really really impressive have a look at this by Carson mm -hmm. orca whale is a very special creature but some are being held or some are being kept in captivity this is not good for the orca's welfare could you imagine being stuck in a swimming pool your whole life with nothing to do except perform tricks. This is what is happening to these poor orcas in captivity. They will never get to explore the, the wondrous ocean. You can help to stop this. Free the orcas.
So he picked the orca, and I have to say, top job there. Hard work, rewarded by popping up with us. Thank you very much for showing it. Question just in there, we'll finish on this one for now. This is a question from Rachel on Garden Hierarchy, and it says, um, can wasps uh, sting spiders? Big question. We had a wasp fly in our shed, and it flew into a huge spider's web. Now, the spider went to get it, and the wasp flew away. If the spider had managed to, to reach it, who would win? Invariably, the spider. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, wasps normally will only use their sting to attack things which are trying to predate it, them, not things they are trying to predate. I mean, wasps are predators, of course, but they normally kill them by, you know, basically dismembering them with their very powerful mandibles. And they don't use their sting to attack their prey. So obviously, if the spider was a potential predator of the wasp, you would think that the wasp might get a chance to, to sting it. But once a wasp is in a spider's web, and I've seen this happen, the spiders are so adept at handling the wasp that they're able to position themselves that they you know, can get in and get their chelicery, their fangs, into a, a soft part of that wasp and inject their venom um, and then wrap it up very quickly and incapacitate it so it would be incapable of stinging the spider. So a lucky escape for the wasp, I would say. Mm. I'm not quite a fan of wasps, but don't dislike spiders, but obviously, but yeah, good to see. But mm. I'll tell you why particularly, because at this time of year, that would have been a queen wasp. And without that queen being able to make a nest, an entire colony just simply wouldn't have happened. Mm. So I, I rescued a queen from the kitchen yesterday. She'd come in and was battering against the window. So at the moment, they're going out, they've emerged from hibernation, they're looking for somewhere to start their nest, uh, a hollow, uh, you know, a, a, a cavity somewhere. Um, often they'll start in somewhere and then move to a bigger nest later. They may be investigating your bird boxes at the moment. They often start in those and then move on. Or, of course, it might be in, in the roof space or in, a, in an old mouse mm. hole or something like that. They are really, really valuable. So, of course, if you are seeing queens coming into your houses, as you might be with the sun shining, you might have your windows open. Queens, bees and wasps will enter your house. Be careful with them and just pick them up and put them outside. Of course, they carry the whole future of the colony for that year inside them. So the chances of them stinging you are absolutely minuscule because yeah. they are so, so valuable and they know how important they are. So if you're able to pick them up and put them outside, carefully, then please do them. Megs? Yes. Really quick one. On the back of that, Rosie says, are horse flies essential to garden life? How do we stop them biting? Uh, Alfie has also been chatting about that, that age 16. Well, it's quite interesting, horse flies, because actually they're not biting. They're actually kind of releasing acid onto our skin. And that's why we get that kind of sudden itchy feeling. I mean, horse flies, they are really, really important, of course, sea composers, things like that. And um, as we were talking about yesterday for our carcass cam. But I mean, how do you stop them biting? It's difficult. It's very they're so difficult. persistent. They're they so really persistent. Are. And they, 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 they don't, they're not put off by any repellents or anything like that, from my experience. And, you know, right. horse flies are one of those things that, unfortunately, if you're going to spend a lot of time in the field, you're going to have to get used to. Yeah. You might be wondering why we've got Sid and Nancy here this morning. Um, and that is because I wanted to talk to you about another animal, which is, um, well, pretty much the same animal. I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> Do you think that Nancy, this small, black, fluffy dog, canid here, is 79.5, 89.5, or 99.5% wolf? So you can guess the answer. She's 99.5% wolf. All of our domestic dogs, no matter what they look like, everything from the Grey Dane to the Chihuahua are descended from grey wolves. And their evolution is quite interesting. Initially, we thought that they were probably first domesticated once we'd started farming and keeping stock. And that would have brought wolves to the enclosures that we had our stock in. But then scientists analysed skulls and found that there were definitely dogs 36 million years ago. We only started farming about 12,000 years ago. So 36,000 years ago, the, the physical evidence suggested that war, uh, dogs had already been domesticated from wolves. But then they did some DNA analysis and found that it went back even further. Between 37 and 42,000 years ago, we domesticated dogs from wolves. About 18 to 24,000 years, there was a divergence and they mixed back up again with wolves, which was interesting. Uh, and then they came, became more dogs. 
another question people often wonder is, where did this process take place? And there's still debate about this. It either happened in Europe or it happened in the East. And we still can't tell. But what we do know now is that there was a single point of domestication. So somewhere on Earth, between 37 and 42,000 years ago, we took wolf cubs and began to domesticate them. How long would it have taken? Well, we don't know, given the archaeology and even the DNA. But there were some experiments that started in 1959 in Russia, where they started to try and domesticate foxes. And they took those foxes, which were unfortunately in fur farms, and they chose repeatedly the tamest ones. And in 50 generations, bearing in mind that's about 50 years, because foxes initially only come into season once a year, they managed to get animals that were piebald, black and white, with shorter ears, curly tails that wagged and licked their owners. They were just about as domesticated as Sid and Nancy in 50 generations. That's a very short period of time. Those foxes are still available as pets in Russia. Uh, the experiment has sadly stopped, but um, people do keep them and they keep them just as they do dogs. You can't do that, obviously, with wild red foxes in the UK. They don't make pets at all. They're not domesticated. They're wild animals, so don't think about dying. Uh, and then one last thing to say is that there's been an upsurge in popularity for what we call wolf dogs. So this is where people take a large breed of domestic dog, something like a German Shepherd, and cross it back with a wolf to get a wolf dog. And this has grown in popularity recently because, of course, Game of Thrones. Lots of blokes out there want to look like and act like Jon Snow. <laughs> Not everything he did was sound, folks, when I watched that series. He made a few mess ups, Jon Snow. Um, and that will cost you £5,000 or more. So those sorts of dogs are, are, are in that price bracket. And they are also, in some places, illegal to keep. So again, I would advise against the wool dog. I'd stick with the poodle. And as I've always said to people, you know, you can take the poodle out of the wolf, but you can't take the wolf out of the poodle. And many of those primal behaviours are still shown by our domestic dogs. If you'd like to know a little bit more about that, then I suggest the best book to, uh, to look at is the first chapter in this book, Tamed by Alice Roberts. This deals with a, a whole group of species, not just dogs, but plants as well. Wheat, uh, maize, potatoes, 10 things which humans have tamed, essentially domesticated, and it's changed the way that we live on planet Earth. A really, really good book, Tamed by Alice Roberts. Such an interesting relationship, isn't it? And the first account of a poodle was in the 15th century with a painting from Germany. Yeah. And they were bred, obviously breeds are something that's relatively recent. Um, we, they were bred for their abilities to hunt, of course, as retrievers. And poodles are exactly that. They are retrieving dogs, they're water dogs. Their curly, curly hair, um, is really resistant to water. So they were used in water-free environments to go and retrieve fowl and things that were shot. So that is how poodles are written. Yeah, and the name poodle, pu poodle, puddle, puddle, wet, water. There we are. They don't like to swim, though. <laughs> they, they, they don't no. like, these, they don't like to, not, no. None of our poodles have ever liked to swim. But that's because we've done a good job of training them not to get No, I've tried. Water. We're not muddy water. We've got some they? brilliant news. I'm going to put Nancy down. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, we've got some absolutely fantastic breaking news for you this morning. Um, this is extraordinary. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something that hasn't happened in the south of England for hundreds of years. 200. 200 years. Mm. And it's only appropriate that at this point we hand over to the one and only Paul, Paul Morton of Paul Hay Project to tell us what's been going on. Take a look at this. Wow. Um, hello. Um, welcome to Dorset. My name is Paul Morton from the Birds Pool Harbour Charity. And I can't quite believe what we're seeing at the moment. But um, first of all, I just want to say thanks to Chris and Megan for allowing us to kind of post this and send this out to everyone because we thought this would be some really exciting news um, to share with everyone. Look at that. Um, this is obviously an osprey and um, our charity back in 2017, we, we started an osprey translocation project in partnership with the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation and Wildlife Windows um, in an effort to try and re-establish ospreys as a breeding species here on the south coast, having not been here for you know about 200 years. Um, sadly, they, they used to be widespread across the whole of Western Europe, but sadly got wiped out, persecuted to extinction and really struggled to recover across a lot of their historical range in Western Europe. Um, so we started our translocation or reintroduction program four years ago and we're just now beginning to see the fruits of our labour which is stunning. Um, 
there's a whole backstory about what we're looking at here, and I'm not going to go into it now because um, we're going to do a series of a few kind of of these small little videos explaining what's going on. But this is mega. This is really mega. So what we wanted to do first of all was let you know that this is available to watch. This is a live stream on our Birds Pool Harbour website, so anyone can tune into this. Um, our Birds Pool Harbour website is just www.birdspoolharbour.co.uk. You go on the home page and it's the first thing you see, you can click and watch this. You can get updates on our Twitter, which is at Harbour Birds, and on our Facebook, which is Birds of Pool Harbour. Um, but this, we're watching history, so what we wanted to do was first of all make everyone aware that this was happening, um, and then tomorrow, and the next day, and then depending on how long this behaviour goes on for, we'll do some more videos. Just, this is a female called CJ7, and what we're ultimately waiting for is her mate, boyfriend, whatever you want to call him. Uh, he's a bird from the translocation project called LS7, and we're just waiting for him to return. But she came in and started nest building, doing all this work at five to six this morning. Um, and you know, it's behavior that hasn't been seen in Southern Britain for 200 years or so. Um, so carry on watching the webcam. We hope the activity kind of, you know, continues. Um, and let's just see what happens over the next few days. Thank you very much. Isn't that just incredible? The idea that we're going to have ospreys potentially nesting again in the south of the UK hasn't been seen in 200 years. And as Paul said, we'll be getting updates from him and Tim Mackerel throughout the next few days to keep an eye on this female's behaviour, see what it's up to and see whether it potentially breeds successfully when that male arrives. First How time. exciting is that? And there's that? lots of good habitat. You've got Pool Harbour, mm. then you've got all the way up through the Solent, you've got Chichester Harbour, you've got Pagham Harbour. These shallow areas of water are excellent hunting places for osprey. So there's no reason to suspect that once they do start breeding here, they shouldn't spread as rapidly as they can. I'd like to find out a little bit more about ospreys, I would recommend this book. This is written by Roy Dennis, A Life of Ospreys. Uh, it's an extraordinary book. Roy was present when they first returned to breed in Scotland uh, in the 1950s. Um, he was uh, instrumental in securing them as a, uh, a breeding species there, protecting them when egg collectors were after them. And then he's gone on to pioneer their reintroduction, not just in Paul yeah. Harbour, but in many other places. Life of Ospreys. We've actually got the live stream up on my laptop and I'm looking at it now and the female is live on the nest. So let's see if we can cut to that. You can get a glimpse of the live Osprey on the nest. CJ7, I believe her what name is. What a picture. Isn't she just beautiful? We'll be keeping an eye on that. And of course, you can follow that on Birds of Paul Harbour YouTube channel as well as their website too. So make sure to keep an eye on that. I love the way that you can see the nest and you've got the heath behind it and, and you know, and then disappearing into the distance with those beautiful. pine trees. It's a great shot as well as just a great bird. <laughs> Top work, Paul, Tim, Roy, everyone else, Mark, you've done a brilliant job down there, fingers crossed. And if you stick with us for the next few days, we'll be able to tell you whether they've laid an egg or not. Well, the mate's got to turn up the first, mates of turn up. Yeah, way off an egg, yeah, mate. Yeah. I was jumping the, jumping the up, whole breeding process. But we'll, but we'll process. keep an eye on it. We're excited. <laughs> Lindsay, have you got any more audience participation to share with us? Yes, yes I yes I do. Stunning nest there. Um, from that, me and producer Fabian are just going to whip you through some of the fantastic pictures we've got on the Self-Isolating Bird Club uh, Facebook and Twitter pages, starting off with this rather excellent blue tit. That's from Ali Dowd. You can tell that one's a male, fantastic, uh, 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 an adult, sorry. Fantastic expression on its face. When the young start to fledge later on in the spring, you can tell the difference because the young have yellow cheeks not white cheeks, so do look out for that. The next one is from Philip Thompson, and uh, that's a great spot woodpecker on the bird feeder, so nice shot there. Keep these coming in to our Facebook page. Neil has taken a picture of a robin, and what I loved about this was the real detail in the colour and the feathers that you can see there. And the final one came from Verity Pixie Hill, which is a wonderful name to begin with, but she has captured a wren and uh, again what I love about wrens is the fact that the males have to build a number of nests and then the female gets to choose the one she likes and she lines it with mud and that is the nest that she uses. I think that should be rolled out in general. It's a very good idea. Two questions from my end to finish with. The first one is about skulls. I know you're going to clear up skull of the day for us and um, the question is what's the best way of preparing skulls when you find a dead animal? So um, this person says, and they didn't leave their name, I usually let nature take its course and then use bicarbonate of soda. A bit harsh. 
Bicarbonate of soda is very harsh, particularly when you're dealing with things like bird skulls that are incredibly fragile. But of course, the best thing to do is to let nature take its course. What you can do is leave it outside for a little bit. Then you get some soapy warm water, a really, really, really fragile, um, soft paintbrush, perhaps, and just brush it a little bit to help get all everything off it. Um, and that's probably the best way to prepare a skull. Yeah, I've been it? just behind us here. We won't go and get it now. I, I have a, a plastic bucket with the um, a skull of uh, a, a roebuck in it, which I picked up a little while ago. And the reason I've left it outside in the bucket is to allow for flies to come. The maggots will do most of that work, removing all of the things that are so tricky to remove if you do it any other way. And then I'll fill the bucket with, as Meg says, mm. hot soapy water. And then I'll use paintbrush and tweezers to remove all of that material. And then I'll just dry it out naturally by putting it up on, on the roof so that the sun can bleach it. So yeah, and with bird skulls, like Meg said, so fragile, it's a painstaking job. I mean, you're going to have to put quite a bit of time in Delicate, very delicate work. I'm pleased we've covered that this breakfast time. That's wonderful. <laughs> and Tom Gender says, I'm sure I heard a willow warbler uh, intersperse its usual descending call with chiff chaff notes. Have you noticed this before? It's so interesting when it comes to bird calls. I have them. Um, I'm not an expert on bird song. I listen to it like every other ornithologist does. Uh, we've got Gary Moore coming on mm. tomorrow, so we can ask Gary if he's ever heard it. I mean, I think if I'm going to stick my neck out here, it's more likely that there were two birds there at the same time. A willow warbler and chiff chaff will share habitat um, you know, and be in the same place at the mm. same time. Maybe it was just the chiff chaff chipping in uh, to the willow warbler's descending song. But if we can ask Gary that yeah. tomorrow, he might know a bit more about that. But I mean, that's the most likely thing. I've certainly never I heard it myself. It. And we don't get to hear willow warblers anymore. They've all disappeared. And those are chiff chaff singing out here. But when I was a kid, all those years ago, willow warblers were common, but they've disappeared from the southeast and become more numerous in the northwest mm. of the UK. Uh, probably showing uh, the same sort of trend that they've showed in Europe, where they become more numerous in Scandinavia. They like it where it's warm and wet, and they've got those warm, wet coastal woodlands. But they look very similar. They're very difficult to tell apart, aren't they? So yeah. the best way to tell Chiff Chaff and Willow Warbler apart is by their song. Chiff Chaff, of course, that Chiff Chaff song. And then you've got the Willow Warbler, which is that beautiful descent song. So, uh, yeah, I haven't heard that either. Nope. Interesting. Well, I can tell you it does get very wet in the northwest of the UK, so not a bad place for them to hang out, but it is lovely in Manchester this morning. Thank you so much for all your questions and comments. There are mimics out there, of course, starlings. They're very good at mimicking other bird calls and house alarms. I've got one that does that here. But um, thank you very much. Keep in touch and great to see you. Bye for now. See you, Lindsay. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank see you, you. Lindsay. So we thought we should wrap up, of course, with the skull of the day. Uh, let's have a look. I'll see if anybody got this right. Um, Right, nothing. Oh, we do have some come through. Some from Facebook. We've got Sue, Elizabeth, Claire, Victoria, Twitter, Darren, K, YouTube, Dick, and Alicia. Well done, to Hold everyone. Hold on, what Right, Shane wasn't there today. Oh, Shane wasn't there today. He's there. Oh, no, he, he is, is there. there. He, he is, is there. there. Sorry, Shane. Well and, done. And, and obviously, he got it right. <laughs> he is the master of all skulls, I think. Now, lots of people correctly said woodpecker so well done to everyone said that but extra bonus points if you got the species specific woodpecker species that we have in the uk it is of course the green woodpecker there's an estimated 52,000 breeding pairs around the uk um, it's a very very shy bird spends most of its time feeding on the ground feeding on ants um, so you'll see it if you see it on the ground that's the main why um, but the most of course characteristic thing is this ridge now of course that is for the tongue and the thyroid bone. Now, I've got a diagram printed out of exactly how this works. So, this is the thyroid bone, this pink area, this pink illustration here. You've got the tongue, which comes out, and it wraps around below the skull, over the top of the head, over the top of the head, and over the left eye where it attaches here. It's a very, very flexible bone um, that has muscle around it that allows the propulsion of the tongue out of course really useful for the green pecker when it's probing into the soil to collect those ants but also very very good when it's drumming now green woodpeckers don't drum very much it's a social behavior for communication they're not big communicators they only kind of get together in their um, monogamous breeding pairs at breeding season the rest of the time they spend time alone um, but they will a a drum occasionally and of course this thyroid bone here acts like a seatbelt to protect their skull from that as well. So isn't it beautiful? It's a thing of beauty, isn't it? It is amazing. And, and it, it sort of cushions the impact of the woodpecker's beak as it hits the wood. And that's decelerating 
uh, somewhere between 60 and 100 G. Now, the G that we can tolerate, in, as if, if you're a fighter pilot, you can do up to nine for a short period of time. If you're an average person like we are, if you put us in a jet, we black out at about mm. three or four G. This bird is decelerating it up, up to 100 G every time it hits the wood. So therefore, it needs adaptations to protect it. And one of those is the bioid bone. Sensational stuff. Now, we were going to finish the, 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 the broadcast this morning with the sound of bird song. Uh, that's going to be impossible because we've got barking poodles and bleating sheep. So I think we'll probably say goodbye with more live pictures coming to you from Birds of Paul Harbour, that fantastic osprey that we've got down there. Have a look at her. Isn't she amazing? <laughs> and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye-bye.